I'm Jeff Sickinga, Executive Director of the Ashbrook Center, and this is The American Idea, coming to you from Peter Schramm's library in Ashland, Ohio. In this podcast, we explore America's crisis in civic education. Too many people today don't understand the history and principles that make us Americans. So we're here to explore America's history and principles and what they mean for today, what we can learn from them, and how we can restore them to their rightful place in our hearts and minds. We think it's the most important thing we can do as Americans to keep our experiment in self-government alive. So thank you for joining us in this important conversation. You can learn more about Ashbrook and the work we're doing with students, teachers, and citizens at ashbrook.org. Well, I want to welcome everyone to this episode of The American Idea. Today, we're going to be talking about, um, I think, an, a very interesting topic. I would argue an understudied topic, but one that's very important for understanding really one of the defining moments in American history, the American Civil War. Today, we're going to be talking about the crisis of American exceptionalism during the Civil War. What was it and why is it so important? And to be joined in this conversation with an old friend, someone who's now becoming an old friend of me, uh, and I'm glad to claim him as that, and also, of course, a friend of Ashbrook and all our work, uh, Professor Andrew Lang. Andy is Associate Professor of History at Mississippi State University and has been associated uh, and been a member of a number of boards, important scholarly boards associated with the study of the Civil War. He has published a number of books and articles, which are terrific. Let me encourage all our listeners to go out, take a look at those and purchase those books. And in particular, for our conversation today, his book entitled A Contest of Civilizations, Exposing the Crisis of American Exceptionalism During the Civil War Era, published in 2021 by the University of North Carolina Press, one of the most famous presses in American history. It's a terrific book. Again, let me commend that to our readers. And let's get into the conversation. Professor Andy Lang, thank you so much for joining us today. Jeff, it's great to be back with you as always. Um, a Contest of Civilization, your book, Exposing the Crisis of American Exceptionalism During the Civil War Era. Okay, that's a lot of words. <laughs> our listeners are folks who know American history, who love American history. They're particularly fascinated by the Civil War and the Civil War era. Help us understand your book and um, what role it plays in helping Americans understand the Civil War. So the book is uh, a long, sweeping narrative history uh, of, the, of the late 18th century, all the way through the late 19th century, in which I try to use the controversial topic and, and concept of American exceptionalism, which I'll define in a moment, uh, to help explain the causes, conduct, and long-term consequences of the entire era. And what I try to show in the book is that uh, a diverse cast of 19th century Americans all regarded the United States as the pinnacle nation uh, within the modern world. Uh, a, a unique nation conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition of human equality, as Lincoln uh, said at Gettysburg. It was a nation that seemed different from the monarchies, aristoc aristocracies, nobilities uh, within a world of oppression and decay. It seemed to those 19th century Americans that the United States had been placed on an inevitable path of destiny, and yet, the commanding place of slavery within a Republic of Liberty imposed irreconcilable understandings of what made the nation unique. And thus, as I argue, led to the Civil War, which tested whether the United States would remain, as Lincoln said, the last best hope of Earth. So let me ask you about this question, American exceptionalism. That's obviously a phrase that we hear today. It's the source of a lot of heated dispute about whether uh, young people should be taught that America is, is exceptional, what it means that America is exceptional. I think even uh, a former president said, yeah, America is exceptional to Americans like Greece is to Greeks. Um, tell us what you mean when you use in the title American exceptionalism. 
It's a great question. And, and I, I must confess, uh, earlier this morning before, uh, before we started recording, I just did a quick Google news search for American exceptionalism. And, and the concept is, uh, is enjoying uh, profound ambivalence uh, in, in the 21st century for, for some of the reasons that you cite. In the book, I make no claim to try to prove or disprove the, the veracity of American exceptionalism, though I myself have uh, very distinct uh, opinions on the matter. Instead, what I try to do is show how contemporaries themselves believe that the United States was, as I said a moment ago, born differently from nations at the time. But what does that mean? Well, it was a, it was a constitutional federal re republic dedicated uh, at that moment in time to the dignity of the individual and the sovereignty of the individual. In a world of monarchy, aristocracy, arb arbitrary privilege, the idea among contemporaries at the time was that the United States was the first nation predicated on the assumption that the individual matters and that government is instituted to uphold the individual's dignity. Now, American exceptionalism is a phrase that is uh, largely, as you said, identified with the 20th century, but there are contemporaries themselves who use the word exceptional to describe what they, what they notice in the early 19th century. Um, by far the most famous uh, exemplar of this is Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, the French uh, aristocrat who toured the United States during the 1830s to locate what he found just to be odd and weird about this upstart republic in the new world. And, and what Tocqueville said is that the situation of the Americans is entirely exceptional. And it is to be believed that no other democratic people will ever be placed in it. What did he mean? For Tocqueville, the United States was unique because it was unbound from the feudal past. It was absolved from a, a, a noble ruling elite. It was uncorrupted by a state church and instead um, a spirit of what he called an equality of conditions infused the American character. So this idea of American exceptionalism that America has, I love the way you put it, is born different. <laughs> Starts with Tocqueville, as you say, or Tocqueville recognizes or argues this, makes that argument. And he, I think, dates it all the way back to the first Puritans who set yes. foot on in New England there in 1620. He says, ever since then, America was just born differently from every other country. Your book, though, talks about from the founding period forward. So you were, you're, you're, you know, Tocqueville starting in 1620. You're, you're talking about 1776 and beyond. Who are some of the early American founders types who say, yeah, America really is different? It's a good question. I, I think one of the most famous uh, is uh, Thomas Paine. Uh, in Common Sense of 1776, he he says that um, e even before the United States is a formal political nation, he says that what has happened in the new world is entirely different from what has happened in the old world, and that the revolution of 1776 will allow Americans, he said, to begin the world anew again. Uh, fast forward uh, 20 years, Thomas Jefferson uh, believes that it is uh, Americans' duty, it is the destiny of the United States to model to the world how to conduct small law Republican government, self-government, at a time in which nations around the world are attempting to model the American example, they're quickly falling into monarchical reaction and state-sponsored oppression to beat back the rise of democracy, or at least a faltering democracy in Europe, in Latin America in the Caribbean, to the point that by the middle of the 19th century, Americans believe, rightly or wrongly, that there are few places on earth that have achieved political liberty, uh, social equality, economic opportunity, the promise to advance. Now, I'm, again, I'm not arguing that these are discernible realities insofar as the American example is concerned. It is the belief on which Americans are, are uh, claiming this uh, for themselves. So who are some of these 19th century folks you're talking about by the 1840s and 50s 
who are following in the in the ideas of Payne and Jefferson and saying, yeah, America really is exceptional in the history of the world. We're been beginning the world over here again. And maybe we even need to expand westward to expand, as Jefferson put it, the empire of liberty. Um, who are some of these people? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And uh, I think implicit in your question, uh, we're starting to see a crack in the mid 19th century American mind about what the purpose of the uh, new United States is. On the one hand, you have uh, expansionists across the political spectrum, um, people like Andrew Jackson and those of the Democratic Party who do believe that it is the United States manifest destiny, to use a famous phrase, to conquer the continent, to spread American institutions, to embed what the Jacksonians may have believed to be American superiority, uh, to colonize uh, uh, quote unquote inferior nations, uh, ideas that justified the Mexican-American war. On the flip side, you have New England transcendentalists. I'm, I'm thinking here of Herman Melville or Ralph Waldo Emerson, who began in the 1840s and 50s using phrases quite explicitly saying, the United States has no history. It exists only in the present and is moving inevitably toward um, a destined future. You also have a group of people who are far more restrained, far more conservative. I'm thinking uh, Whigs like Henry Clay, later Abraham Lincoln, who argue, no, the American purpose is not to be so rapidly, aggressively expansionist. No, what makes the United States unique is the, the example on how to practice restrained, sober self-government in a world that has failed to achieve uh, that goal. So though these folks, they don't look at the rest of the world as moving the same direction as America, so much as America setting the example for the rest of the world to move toward. So America is not caught up in a flow of history. America is out in front and people should be following along with America. Yeah, I think that that is the consensus view in the mid 19th century. And, and, and again, there are reasons for Americans to to think this, if you look at, again, the democratic revolutions that rose and fall in Latin America, the creation of uh, what Henry Clay called our sister republics uh, in the early 19th century, also the failure of the democratic revolutions of 1848 in Europe, the idea that, that, that the world is liberalizing on the American model, but is failing to do so. And, and I think that this is an important point because Americans are constantly measuring themselves against what the rest of the world is and is not doing. And to me, that's an indication that there's a deeply rooted American anxiety about claiming to be unique and destined in the world. If that's true, why constantly measure yourself against what the world is doing? Why constantly be fearful of the rest of the world's failures impinging on the American constitutional experiment? So obviously, uh, folks who say America is unique, America is an exceptional and a model for the rest of the world, because as you put it, we have political liberty, we have social equality, and we have equal opportunity. That in America, a, a humble man can rise to become president. A humble person can rise to own their own business and flourish in life. A humble person can own their own land, which they never could have done in the old world of Europe. All of those things. And here, citizens greet each other, and you don't have to doff your cap to your superior, that sort of thing, right? Indeed. If all of those things are in the American mind, say, what makes Americans exceptional and American, the obvious problem that you point to in your, in your book and in your earlier remarks is, yeah, but what about slavery? It contradicts political liberty, it contradicts social equality, and obviously, it contradicts equal economic opportunity. Yeah, and this is at the root. Of, of the entire crisis of American exceptionalism in the 19th century. Um, and this is at the root of why the Civil War comes and why the Civil War is waged. So slavery is a, ha has an interesting and a central history uh, in the exceptionalist narrative. Uh, if we go back to the 1770s, even before the creation of the American Republic, what do we see happening? We see the world's first fledgling, though uh, still uh, mobilized, anti-slavery societies questioning a government's role and, and responsibility to uphold property and man. 
And we start to see grassroots, gradual em emancipation movements happening for the first time in the modern world, leading to the assumption that the United States will not be, or does not have to be, a uniform slaveholding nation. Well, over time, the assumption that the Declaration matters, that the words in the Declaration are literal, all men are created equal, starts to come into conflict, uh, conflict with an alternative reading of exceptionalism proffered by powerful slaveholders who, during the early and mid-19th century, took control of the federal government, used the mechanisms of the constitutional order to transform the United States into the world's unquestioned largest slaveholding empire by 1850. And so we have this interesting dichotomy between the United States having uh, uh, some kind of anti-slavery sentiment at its origins, coexisting with some kind of slaveholding identity at its origins, and the two grow diametrically apart. For slaveholders, what, does, what makes the mid-19th century United States unique? Well, it's what I just said. Only here, slaveholders argued, can we prove the natural, seemingly natural, moral, organic hierarchy of racial stability, racial slavery, racial authority. The rest of the world has moved against slavery in some form or fashion. But slaveholders are arguing, look at the decay, look at the economic decline in the Caribbean, in Latin America. But we here are doing something different. Well, but as you just said a moment ago, Jeff, anti-slavery skeptics are, are, are thinking about the slaveholding argument and saying, well, well no. If, if slaveholders imagine the United States to be a hierarchical, uh, monarchical, despotic nation, then our claim to uniqueness and purpose in the world is for naught. If slaveholders can control land, they can control resources, they can control the economy, they can control politics for a very select few of oligarchic aristocrats, what possible chance does a common citizen have in securing his or her own economic and political independence? So I'm thinking here of someone, um, you say the American mind starts to split, people saying, no, America is exceptional in its commitment to liberty and equality for all. Now we just have to figure out how to live up to that. And then others saying, no, as you just put it, America is exceptional in being able to prove here racial superiority and inferiority. Um, who on that side is making that argument? It's a good question. Um, by 1850, uh, all prominent slaveholders are making that argument. And I think it's- So who some of our listeners would think of what names would you associate? Yeah, with? Uh, let's see, George Fitzhugh, James Henry Hammond, John C. Calhoun, Jefferson Davis, um, even, even a most committed slaveholding unions like Alexander Stevens, uh, the, the, the future vice president of the Confederacy. This is the argument that uh, they are making. Even lesser known names, uh, uh, like a South Carolina intellectual named Louisa McCord wrote track after track uh, on, this, on this subject. And I can, I can offer you uh, a very brief quote from McCord. She's, she's uh, uh, immensely quotable because she's so honest. She said, uh, quote, the question of race then is most important in our consideration of Negro slavery. And then she asked whether, quote, the civilized world will be convinced that all the races do not have the same abilities, enjoy the same powers, or show the same natural dispositions. And she goes on to say, look, it is here in the American South that we feed the world, we clothe the world, we model to the world how to construct a society that is absent the turbulence of modern uh, free market capitalism, that is absent the rambunctious democratic clamors of, of mid 19th century life. No, no, everything here is ordered and it grows from nature because race and racial, race, racial subordination itself is natural. And now what's gonna happen when you have a political party that comes along in the mid 1850s and 1854, the Republican party an anti-slavery national political party and starts to question the basic assumptions of this slaveholding argument. And that party, am I right to say, it wants to argue, no, 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 
we want to go back to the American founding understanding of American exceptionalism, as proclaimed by Thomas Jefferson, for example, and say, no, 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 you're leading us down the wrong understanding of American exceptionalism. We need to go back to that idea of America's exceptional because of liberty, because of equality, because of social e equality, equal economic opportunity, all of those things the Republican Party says, we need to go back to those and advance those as the understanding of what makes America an exceptional country. Indeed, and, and few mainstream Republicans are advocating for a social or political revolution in their anti-slavery stance. But what they are advocating is that people are either people or they're not. And our Declaration of Independence, we read literally, they say. All men are created equal. Well, that means something. If that's true, then it is simply immoral and violating the laws of nature for uh, one human to enslave another. And so what is the solution to this? As the Republicans say, make freedom national and make slavery sectional. In other words, prevent slavery's expansion, prevent the creation of a uniform slave nation, place slavery, as Lincoln said, on the road to ultimate extinction. And how do you do this? You have to shape the public mind. You have to shape public sentiment. You have to reorient the American mind back, as you said, Jeff, to the original proposition uh, taken literally uh, in the American founding. This to compete, I'm, I'm really beginning to understand the, 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 uh, the title of your book, <laughs> A Contest of Civilizations. You have two different civilizational understandings. What is American civilization? You have this argument, liberty, equality, and the rest, and you have no hierarchy, racial hierarchy and other hierarchy. Is that the contest of civilizations? It is. Um, and this is this is what I try to argue in the book. This is not, I would encourage our listeners, our, our readers, not to think of the sectional crisis as a as a contest between the quote unquote North uh, with a with a national view versus the South with a states' rights view. It's far more than that. It is a contest quite literally about what the American nation is going to do and serve in the, in, the, in the unfolding of the global future. If the United States is, as exceptionalists proclaimed, is the model for the world, then what is it going to look like? Because I can assure you, it is not going to be a situation in which, fast forwarding into the uh, future, a United States and a Confederate States are going to share equally. Um, in the territorial um, claim to North America. No, it is, it is quite literally all or nothing by the time of the American Civil War. And everybody is very clear about this. If we think, if, if we fast forward to 1860, 61, in the wake of Lincoln's election and the pledge, the Republican pledge to place slavery on the road to ultimate extinction, well, what does that mean if you're a slaveholder? What does that mean if you believe that the basis of modern life is rooted in slavery. Well, that's what the Confederacy is in, uh, is is intended to uh, to demonstrate. Okay, let's let's go to what uh, Alexander Stevens says in his infamous uh, Cornerstone Address. He lays it all out, and he says that this country, the Confederate States of America, is quote the first in the history of the world based upon the great physical and philosophical moral truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race is his natural and moral condition. That is exceptionalist rhetoric through and through. First, in the history of the world, there is a charting of a new historical trajectory right here. Jefferson Davis, 1861, spring of 1861, as president of the Confederacy, doubles down on this. And he says, we will make a new history for ourselves. This is very clear what they are doing. And they are laying claim to the whole continent. Stevens himself says this. He says, our destiny is in our hands. And the Confederacy is, quote, the nucleus to disintegrate the old union and become the controlling power on this continent. 
The stakes are very clearly defined, they're laid out, and both sides get what's going on. Before we continue with our conversation, I'd like to take a moment and ask you to learn a little more about the Ashbrook Center and how you can help us continue our work with teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chad Kiefer, a Director of Philanthropy and Strategic Partnerships here at Ashbrook. At its heart, America's story is about the lives of patriots who have given their last full measure of devotion to preserve and protect what it means to be an American. But the tragic truth is that the American story is being rewritten as one of oppression and despair. Back in 1776, the founders took a chance when they created a new government built on principles of liberty. They took a chance on America. Now I'm challenging you to do the same. Your gift to Ashbrook today reaches students, teachers, and citizens across the country, helping them to understand why America is worthy of their devotion. With so many forces eroding our history and taking away from our principles, isn't it time we give America a chance? Your investment is encouraged now more than ever. Please visit us today at ashbrook.org backslash support. So and in this respect, the, the, the vice president of the Confederacy, the president of the Confederacy, as you say, have a civilizational understanding of the Confederacy. It's not just a geography, the South. It's not just a collection of states. It's an entire civilization and way of life that it wants to make central, as you said there, across the entire continent. And it's different while it's hierarchical. I was struck by the word first, which you emphasized in Stephen's speech. First, meaning that yes, the old world of Europe was hierarchical, it was aristocratic, it was monarchic, but we're the first because those aristocracies and monarchies were not racially based, whereas this one is. Is that how it understood itself to be exceptional and different compared to Europe? Very much so. And they, they meaning Confederates, are overwhelmingly, explicitly, forwardly making this very argument that you just stated, Jeff. Um, and why why would they obfuscate it? Why would they why would they try to conceal their 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 purpose and their endeavor? They're proud of this, um, especially the elites, especially those who hatched secession and formed the Confederacy. They believe that they are on the forward march of history, and they're doing something new here, at least as they understood it. And as and Stephen said, this is an imperial endeavor. It is not simply to to lay claim to the um, territorial status of the 11 states that comprised uh, the Confederacy. That's only step one. They're imagining expanding into the Southwest, expanding into the Caribbean, but also over time, why not expand into the United States? If the United States is so illegitimate and so corrupted by anti-slavery tendencies, you can't have an anti-slavery nation on your Northern frontier. It's gotta go at some point may not be in the next four or five years, but at some point it has to go. And unionists understood this. I, I will give you one example. Uh, one of the great mid 19th century abolitionists, uh, a woman by the name of Lydia Maria Child, she knew that Stevens and Davis were, were right. And she said, we must conquer the rebels for they will assuredly invade us and force their institutions upon the country. And she goes, point by point by point on what this looks like. There's no more free education. There's no more free speech. There's no more free elections because of the corruption and the imperial uh, uh, endeavors that the Confederacy uh, has, has in mind. So um, how would leading Confederates then deal with the American founders like Thomas Jefferson, who seem to think no American exceptionalism is embracing equality and perhaps eventually even getting rid of slavery and having equal opportunity economically, at least for all people, how do they deal with them? Well, um, it, it's tortured, as you might imagine. Um, on the one hand, they, they believe that they are exercising the founding promise and example of self-determination. They are very careful not to say that they are revolutionists because revolution has a has a natural law uh, uh, tendency about it which then conflicts with um, 
uh, Confederates' claims to slaveholding. So instead, what are they saying? Our fundamental rights as citizens are not being upheld in the United States, that we are a, a, a permanent political minority in which our constitutional and political equality is being rejected. And thus, just like our forefathers, we are exercising our natural right to self-determination. But then on the other hand, if we read further in Stevens, he makes it abundantly explicitly clear that the equality principle, the consent principle in the Declaration of Independence, the principle of, of uh, all men are created equal, Stevens says that is wrong, that Jefferson is wrong. Stevens is not the first one to make this case. This had been um, a leading trope among uh, pro-slavery activists all throughout the 1840s and 50s, that, that the American revolutionaries had gone one step too far. But this is what Lincoln had long been arguing uh, against throughout his public career going back to 1854, in which Lincoln says, no, we take seriously what he would have considered the life-giving principle of nationhood. It's not simply nationhood itself. It's not simply a matter of 13 colonies rebelling and forming a new nation. It is what Lincoln said is behind that and entwined closely about the human heart. And that is the problem that all men and women are given a chance because of their natural equality to rise in life. That's what's at stake is the life-giving principle. Lincoln famously said in the 1850s, quoting the Bible, right, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Um, how did the, uh, the, the proponents of the other view of American exceptionalism, of liberty and equality, that view of American exceptionalism, how did they deal with um, themselves try to reconcile the problem of slavery? They... You said they they thought in principle it morally was on the path of ultimate extinction, but it's one thing to have that moral principle. It's another thing to actually bring American practice into uh, accordance with that principle. How they yeah. argue to do that? Yeah, yeah. This is this is this is great. Um, the nature of your question is is the basis on which Lincoln emerges as as a leading public figure in the 1850s. Lincoln comes to public life, of course, not necessarily out of his opposition to the slaveholding argument. He, he, he comes into public life uh, in opposition to a fellow Northerner, not just a fellow Northerner, but a fellow Illinoisan from his home state, Stephen A. Douglas, who is making the, the very claim that you just laid out, in which Douglas is saying, look, the slavery issue is, is annoying, it is obnoxious, it, it, it fills the nation with political rancor, let's just move beyond it. Right, And his whole basis of let the people in the territories decide for themselves, a simple up or down vote, a 51-49 majoritarian rule, what could be more American and unique than popular sovereignty? It is democracy that makes the nation fundamentally unique. It is our, it is our own self-determination as a free people that allows us to be a model in the world. And it is that, and not necessarily the pro-slavery argument that Lincoln is so alarmed by. Because in, in, in Lincoln's mind, the slavery question, contra to Douglas, the slavery question will never be fully resolved if there is a house divided. It has to be all one thing or all another, Lincoln says. And that, that trial is going to, to happen at some point, right? There is going to be a contest at some point over what the house will look like. And if it's all one thing in terms of all slavery, then all political liberty as the last best hope is gone. Where else in the world is this kind of promise going to be renewed, restored, restarted? Lincoln said, no. Once it dies here, it's, it's dead for all time. And thus we can't be ambivalent to the proposition like Douglas is. We have to be as morally committed to the principle of freedom as slaveholders are as morally committed to the principle of slavery. Now, I've got a, the other the other words, important phrase, obviously, in your, the sub, subtitle of your book is civil war. Um, this is the clash of civilizations, the contest of civilizations, as you put it, coming up to the civil war. 
I'm just thinking now, and this thought has occurred to me in, in conversation with you. Uh, one of the things that Winston Churchill said about the American Civil War was how remarkably bitter it was. Not just brother against brother, but brother against brother fighting for every inch of soil to the death. Is part of the viciousness, the ferocity, the bloodshed of the Civil War, this contest of civilizations? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, and it's and it's complex. I think the first thing we need to say is that despite how unconscionably destructive, bloody, um, and overwhelming the Civil War was, it actually could have been much worse. Uh, part of the okay, now I, that's an unusual <laughs> thing to say. It is. <laughs> it is. It is. And here, here's here, here's what I mean. So during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, it was fashionable for, for scholars and observers of the, of the Civil War, um, critics of the Civil War, to, to think of the contest as a total war on, on par with uh, World War II. And I'm here to, I'm here to say it was not. Uh, it was, again, remarkably destructive, but it also imposed careful restraints on the conduct. Here's what I mean. If we think about the Civil War as being waged between two modern mid 19th century nation states, the United States and the Confederacy, then the very claim to nationhood is necessarily going to impose legal limitations on what a nation can do. So, for example, the Confederacy modeled itself, advertised itself in the same vein as George Washington's Continental Army. What do I mean by that? Washington believed that in order to gain uh, international credibility, international recognition, the revolutionaries had to fight like a legitimate nation. An army with professional officers who uh, train their soldiers, who maintain codes of conduct, who abide by the laws of war. Likewise, the Confederates simply could not wage an unrestrained guerrilla conflict uh, that uh, rejected the laws of war, that rejected uniform standards. On the other hand, the United States simply could not treat the Confederates as lawless rebels. If you do, quite literally, the punishment should be death to all soldiers cap captured in battle, death to anyone on the home front. That is a total war. But that did not happen. Yes, the uh, Lincoln administration never gave formal diplomatic or political legitimacy to the Confederacy, but they did give de facto credibility to the way in which military conduct is restrained by law and moral reason. And so while the, while the Civil War, again, is, is, is by far the bloodiest conflict in American history, it also has carefully imposed restraints because both nations, quote unquote, both nations claim to be unique among the world. In the conduct of the war itself, when we get to 1861, all the way through 1865. Um, you mentioned before that the elites who, as you said, hatched um, secession, really did believe in this slavery civilization idea and believed it to cultivate it in the South and then spread it across the continent. Lots of people like Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and others believed in the freedom civilization, as I'm calling it. Um, they were also, of course, elites in their own way. Um, the ordinary people who were involved in the struggle, the ordinary Confederate soldier, the ordinary Union soldier, the ordinary woman at home, the ordinary mother of a, in Alabama worried about her son, do they think of this conflict as a contest of civilizations also? Such a good question. Um, short answer is yes, unequivocally yes. The American Civil War features uh, uh, an entire population between the United States and the Confederate States of, of populations that are overwhelmingly literate. They knew the reasons for which they were fighting. They wrote it down. They spoke it. They articulated. They committed themselves to it. And it makes sense why they would. They're among uh, the most educated citizenries in the mid-19th century world. Lincoln called um, Union soldiers uh, thinking bayonets. They're not automatons. Well, that's a great term. I've it never is. heard that. 
yeah, uh, in, in 1862, he's corresponding with a, a, a Frenchman. And Lincoln is, is writing about, look, this is what makes our soldiers just different here. They are democratic citizens, meaning they cannot be treated unjustly in the ranks. There's a limit to what officers can do to them because who are their officers? They're their neighbors from the pre-war years. They're the guy down the street. In civil society, they're equal. That equality maintains a degree of consistency when the war starts. Um, Ulysses S. Grant has a wonderful passage in, the, in his memoirs toward the end, where he also says the great armies of Europe uh, were, were filled with men who did not know the reasons for which they were fighting. I'm, I'm sure that's a little uncharitable on Grant's part, but his point is that our, our soldiers did know. And I, I, I can assure you, our, our testimony, our, our overwhelming voluminous testimony of diaries, letters, speeches from common citizens uh, are so easily accessible today, and they're all ubiquitous in their sentiments on both sides, um, explaining exactly what this war means um, in exactly the same terms we've been discussing the last half hour. Well, I think of, for example, even just popular songs. I think of uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic. Right. If you listen yes. to the lyrics carefully, you realize it's written by people who really do believe in in that God is on the side of the freedom civilization. To be sure, um, there there there's a whole new subliterature now uh, that deal with Civil War songs and music uh, on this on this topic on both sides, and it's not just songs; it's literature, it's uh, fiction. It's um, primers for school children on, in, in both the United States and the Confederacy. It's poems, uh, it's popular culture, it's art, it's everywhere. Um, our listeners are, are gonna wanna know, besides your wonderful book, what other books or maybe TV shows or movies that you recommend that really help to tell this story of a contest of civilizations? Yeah, um, there, there are numerous books that, that really factored into my understanding of this subject. Um, and I, I will give a few titles. Uh, from the early 90s, uh, one of the great intellectual historians of early America, a man by the name of Jack Green, uh, wrote a book called The Intellectual Construction of America. And in The Intellectual Construction of America, Green shows how exceptionalism uh, ideas were formulated among Europeans and people who did live in what became North America, how exceptionalist ideas were formed long before the United States itself was created. That most observers understood, or at least argued, I should say, that there was something different about what was happening in North America. Another book I would recommend, uh, which I think is just, just a fabulous book by the great Harvard historian, David Armitage is called The Declaration of Independence, A Global History. It's a, it's a delightfully short book, but what uh, Armitage shows is that from 1776 until the 21st century, nations and peoples around the world modeled their own liberation movements and their own declarations of independence on the basis of the one written in the United States, or at least announced the creation of the United States in 1776. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, what about, really... what about fiction or oh, movies fiction. Hmm. or TV shows, you would say, that tell the story of this understanding of a civilizational conflict? Hmm. Well, I, or... I think I, I think I think one of the one of the best ones, uh, one, one of the best civil war or I, I'll give you two civil war movies uh, that, that, that approach this subject differently. It, it's two that everyone's heard of, but the first is Glory, uh, the, the by far the best um, Civil War movie ever made. And while it's not overwhelming in its civilizational, um, you know, beat you over the head uh, uh, bombast, it, it very subtly and with nuance shows just how much was at stake for recently emancipated African-American men who served in the ranks, uh, at least in Glory, of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment that the war was absolutely critical and fundamental for the future of uh, freedom and the hope for uh, something better, um, the, the absolute destruction of slavery. And, and, it, and it deals with, in, in many ways in my book, uh, similarly, 
the central role that African-American men and women played in this entire story. The second movie, of course, uh, is Lincoln, uh, the Steven Spielberg uh, uh, movie. Um, it too is more subtle, but it, 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 it plays on this role or this, this question of there's something very much at stake. And in, and in Spielberg, Spielberg's rendition, it's the, it's the passage of the 13th Amendment and Lincoln as a, as a foremost advocate of the 13th Amendment as a means to, to finally author a consensual national recognition that freedom is indeed national. And at least by 1865, slavery is not sectional. It is, as Lincoln said, dead. Fascinating. And let me recommend, of course, to our readers that they follow up, take a look at those films, but also, of course, follow up with Andy's wonderful book, A Contest of Civilizations, Exposing the Crisis of American Exceptionalism During the Civil War Era. Uh, it has really, I think it will give, it has given me, and I, I think it will give our listeners a whole new and deeper view of the meaning of the American Civil War. Andy Lang, thanks so much for joining us today on The American Idea. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for listening to this episode of The American Idea. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to subscribe at Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and leave a five-star review. If you want to learn more or get involved in Ashbrook's vital work, visit our website, ashbrook.org.